Thanks so much, Bob. And I would like to say thank you to you, to Roy, to Deborah for creating such a lovely atmosphere for us and, uh, and organizing us in such a convivial fashion. So thank you very much. Is the sound okay? Okay. So in my lectures uh, so far, I've introduced two kinds of cities, uh, two models of mediation across troubled divides. The first city was Barcelona, a city defined by its uneasy doubleness, by the reflections of distorted mirrors across town, where women writers and translators were active in reanimating the image of the Catalan city. Then I presented the case of the politically divided city, where a border runs through the city and turns it into two warring camps. My example was Nicosia in Cyprus, the last divided capital in Europe. And in today's lecture, I'll be talking about another kind of city, another kind of mediation, cities at the edge of empire, liminal or border cities, whose identity is defined by their position between different orders of cultural and political reality. <coughs> J.M. Coetzee's 1980 novel, Waiting for the Barbarians, tells the story of a middle-aged magistrate who chooses to end his days in a lazy imperial outpost, devoting himself to archaeological digs. He's excavated a large number of slivers of wood that all seem to have some sort of message written on them. But the writing is ancient and impenetrable, and he has been unable to decipher the message. But when the representatives of the empire appear in town and start a war against the barbarians, and when the magistrate is being tortured in order to translate what the emperor's representatives now consider to be crucial evidence, the magistrate suddenly finds words to transmit the messages he reads from the slips. They are messages from the prisoners for their families. They are intimate and immediate and alive. The light of power brought to bear on this writing forces the magistrate to give these words meaning, not the meaning expected by his interrogators, but a meaning he has invented to convey his understanding of the barbarians and who they are. But the exercise only proves the essential premise of Coetzee's novel, that the barbarians are in fact unknowable, that their language cannot be translated into that of the imperial order because the empire chooses to, chooses to maintain an absolute separation between it and what lies outside it. The edge of empire is a powerful trope to evoke a heightened awareness of the line devoting communi dividing community from outsider, the self from other, the center of power from what lies outside. Coetzee's magistrate is one in a long line of characters in fiction who convey the sense of uneasiness of this place, a seedy, rundown, lackadaisical place, unafraid of what lies behind, beyond until the authorities arrive to stir up for their own political purposes, the boundary between us and them. For the authorities, the barbarians are important. They confirm the sense of us. This is the meaning of Cavafy's poem, the poem that inspired Coetzee, which, which is called Waiting for the Barbarians, um, which ends with the lines, because night has fallen and the barbarians have not come, and some who have returned from the border say, there are no barbarians any longer. And now what's going to happen to us without barbarians? They were, these people, a kind of solution. That's the conclusion of Cavafy's poem. The barbarians are a kind of solution because they confirm the boundaries, as this wonderful image shows. Gives us a clear sense of our identity. These tropes of empire and barbary meant a lot to Kosia and to Kavafi. Coetzee as a writer dealing with the line of color in South Africa, Kavafi as a Greek-speaking writer living in Alexandria in the first years of the 20th century. Kavafi lived at the edge of the Mediterranean and was fascinated by Hellenic civilization, the plurality of history, peoples, languages, and cultures that was in some sense a response to the classical Greek culture. He was fascinated by the borders of great empires during times of transition and decline, 
and his poems reflected this fascination both in content and in form, mixing varieties of Greek, and in his own identity as a diasporic writer. He was a Greek-speaking writer living in Alexandria. Now I would like to move to the empire that will be of interest in what follows, and that's the Habsburg Empire, more precisely the Austro-Hungarian Empire that extended across Europe in the 19th century. Joseph Roth, a writer born in Brody in Galicia, at the extreme eastern edge of the empire, was intensely, was intensely aware mm, of living the decline of this empire and the fact that he often refers in his fiction to the edge of empire, the borderlines, conveys a strong sense of his understanding of decline. In the Radetzky March and in the Inspector of Weights and Measures, Roth writes of the border as a zone of lawlessness and perdition, a place of confusion, where similarly to Coetzee, the bureaucrat loses his bearings because too far from the imperial center, but also where there is intense traffic with what, what lies beyond the border, smuggling, consorting, drinking, all the things that finally drag the inspector of weights and measures to his downfall. Here the border is a place where it is impossible to maintain separations, to maintain proper standards. He is, after all, the officer of weights and measures. To impose the regulations that come from Vienna. But this disorder can be productive, and strangely, the border zone becomes an idealized space for Roth, a space of uncontrolled mixtures in the image of the multilingual empire, which is more fully itself at its edges. In fact, Roth reveled in the ungovernable plenitude of the empire, both as a journalist and a novelist. <clears throat> a zone of uncertainty and multiplicity, the edge of empire is also a translation zone, an area of intense interaction across languages. Through analogy with Mary Louise Pratt's influential contact zone, the term refers to social spaces where disparate cultures meet clash and grapple with each other, often in highly asymmetrical relations of domination and colonialism, slavery, or their aftermaths. Emily Apter's well-known book, The Translation Zone, extends this idea, exploring the many forms that translation can take, including practices of hybridity and creolization. A translation zone might cover a large geographical expanse such as multilingual empires like the Russian Habsburg or Ottoman empires, multilingual nations like India. It can be applied to specific border transactions like those of the US-Mexican border. And it can refer to the micro spaces of the multilingual city. Zone responds to the need to situate translated, uh, translation activity within clearly delimited geographies which are not framed by the nation. Particularly, per particularly germane are spaces like what Marcel Cornus Pope and John Neubauer call nodal cities as literary interfaces. Vilnius, Riga, Chernovitz, Danzig, Bucharest, Timisoara, Plovdiv, Trieste, Budist, Budapest, and Prague, these all display the special character of multilingual cities in a time of competing nationalisms. They are relays of literary modernization and pluralization. Whether provincial cities like Chernovitz or and Bratislava, or metropolitan centers like Prague or Budapest, participating in a plurality of language traditions and history. In some ways, prefiguring the multifaceted and decentered Western city of immigration, East Central European literary representations offer paradigms, and I'm quoting them, paradigms of plural societies that give insights into crucial questions of our time, questions concerning the preconditions for the fruitful interaction of peoples from different religious, linguistic, and cultural backgrounds, as well as questions concerning the causes of violence and war in communities that had enjoyed peace for centuries. So the Central European city, of course, offers particularly tragic uh, stories of uh, interaction and non-interaction. <clears throat> 
The intense transactions of the translation zone put pressure on the idea that linguistic transfer occurs between a foreign source and a local target readership. In the spaces of borderlands or nodal cities, members of diverse cultures are neighbors and share a single territory. This means that the frames of language exchange must be recast to respond to more subtle understandings of the relation between language, territory, and identity. What happens when translations take place among communities that share geographical and cultural references? How do the competition and animosities that inevitably flourish in multilingual geopolitical contexts shape translation? Languages that share the same terrain rarely participate in a peaceful and egalitarian conversation. Their separate and competing institutions are wary of one another, aggressive in their need for self-protection. So movement across languages mar is marked by the special intensity that comes from these shared references and a shared history. Uh, Michaela Wolf has recently published a study called uh, which uh, I won't read the German, but it's a study of translation in the Habsburg Empire, just published last year. Um, a very a detailed study, an innovative study of translation practices within the empire. She explores not only the formal practices of translation dictated by the empire's language laws, which meant that government officials had to serve their clients in their own national languages, but also the myriad informal practices of translation which were part of daily life. The Bohemian maids who had to learn to serve in German. The tradespeople who had to learn German terminology. The informal exchanges through which children would be sent to neighboring villages of the empire to learn languages across the border. While most of the translation practices she describes in relation to the Habsburg Empire were one way, that is, into the dominant language of German. The extraordinary multilingualism of the city of Vienna during this period, but also of the many provincial capitals, like Chernovitz, made these cities true translation zones, and in many ways precursors to today's multilingual diasporic and post-colonial cities. We don't usually see them that way because their history was cut off, because the history of these multilingual cities um, was cut off by the events of the Second World War and then by the uh, Soviet occupation. So the challenge is to see these cities as translation zones before. Finally, the border or translational city also imposes on the scholar who studies it an obligation of translation. In his detailed historiography of social democracy in Bratislava, Van Duyn emphasizes the fact that he has consulted sources in half a dozen languages, including Slovak, Czech, German, English, and Hungarian. Rare would be the scholars who could tell the story of any central European city from the perspective of any one community. So there is an epistemological imperative to translate at work in studying these cities. That's an additional layer of the translational nature of these cities. Um, to, to, to read the history of these cities in, an, in only one language is to only get one, one version, one, one perspective. So this morning I'm going to talk about one city at the edge of empire, and that city is Chernovitz. So I don't think you actually see Chernovitz on these maps, but you do see the Bukovina. Okay, so that's the eastern edge of the Habsburg Empire. You can't go any farther. Any farther and you've fallen off. You can, there you, again, you see the Bukovina. <clears throat> so located on the most eastern frontier of the empire, Chernovitz was the site of a rich literary culture, a culture of the border. Chernovitz was a provincial capital which developed a German language identity despite its distance from Vienna. It was a city which saw intense literary activity. It was a very bookish city where many women were involved in literary activities and whose literatures were in many ways translational. That is, 
developed against the background of language contact. Um, and here I will just re recall the definition of translation which I gave in the first lecture. Translation is writing at the intersection of languages. So it's a very broad, um, a broad definition. And translation, writing which is translational, doesn't necessarily have to be a translation, but it's written in the context of multilingualism and then reacting against that multilingualism or through it or with it. So translational is not multilingual, and I think I've already discussed this, that multilingualism calls up a space of pure diversity, of proliferation of tongues and parallel conversations. Um, by contrast, the translational city is a space of connecting and converging communities of directionality and incorporation. It's also a city that can foster distances as well. It's that directionality and incorporation can be a resistance as well. It's a self-consciousness. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the sense of being with and among languages. Relations between languages are indicators of the extent to which the city's languages participate in a more general conversations of cultural citizenship. It follows that the translational city is not always a site of peaceful and friendly transactions. It includes the refusal to translate zones of silence and resistance. German in Chernovitz was the language of prestige. But Chernovitz also saw the birth of Ukrainian and Romanian modernist writing, as well as Yiddish. As a means of protecting his territories from the Russian and Ottoman expansion, Joseph II had turned the eastern provinces of the Austro-Hungarian Empire into buffer zones. He actively promoted the settlement of Germans from Austria and southwestern Germany, as well as the Germanization of Ruthenians, which is the ancestor of Ukrainians, and Romanians, the two largest ethnic groups in the Bukovina. In the period of liberalism from 1848 on, many Jews settled in the major Bukovinian cities. And by 1918, 47% of the population of Chernovitz was Jewish. Since Bukovinian Jews were particularly loyal to the Habsburg monarchy, and instrumental in its expansion in that region, Austrian officials tended to consider them representatives of the Habsburg Empire. So they were in some ways guardians of the border, um, standing on that border between the empire and uh, what lay beyond it, loyal citizens of, of the empire. It might be useful to discuss how I became interested in this city. Several roads brought me to Chernovitz a city probably best known as the birthplace of Paul Celan, but otherwise largely forgotten. In 2010, Marianne Hirsch and Leo Spitzer published Ghosts of Home, a richly textured study of the city, which they first visited in 1998, along with their parents, whose memories became the key to their investigation into the past life of this Central European city. During its most glorious years, Chernovitz was known as Little Vienna, an outpost of Austrian culture on the frontier. With the help of living relatives still in Chernovitz and historical research, Hirsch and Spitzer show the story as a site of history, the city as a site of history and memory, of nostalgia and catastrophe, a story of the Holocaust, which is specific to this city, at the junction of three nationalisms, German, Ukrainian, and Romanian and which for a long century cultivated a passionate attachment to the values of German culture. This fidelity to the German language persisted into the interwar period in the form of what Hirsch and Spitzer call the idea of Deutschtum, an ideal of Germanness which expressed itself with increasing intensity even as the city was brought under the authority of Romanian cultural nationalism because in 1918 the Bukovina uh, became uh, Romanian, or at least a part of the Bukovina, I'm actually not sure if it's the whole, but Chernovitz um, became Romanian in 1918 with the fall of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. <clears throat> Paradoxically, <clears throat> it was precisely, I've forgotten to bring water this time. Uh, sorry, 
<coughs> sorry to any kind, whatever. Thank you. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Paradoxically, it was precisely in the interwar period that Bukovina's German literature, in particular its Austro Jewish component, reached a pinnacle. And I'm quoting from here from Amy Cullen, who is also someone who has written a great deal about Chernovitz and its translational nature. So strong was the attachment of Jewish poets to the Austro-German culture that they continued to write in German in spite of their growing isolation in a Romanian-speaking environment. Much of this writing was conventional. Such traditionalism, argues Amy Cullen, thank you so much, was not due to a lack of innovating power, but rather the result of their unusual situation. <clears throat> thank you. As German, <clears throat> as German poets in a multilingual surrounding. <clears throat> Their growing isolation produced insecurity about their native language, which manifested itself in a strong attachment to established poetic values. <clears throat> so this is the explanation. Unlike most Bukovinians who spoke a German mixed with Ukrainian, Romanian, and Yiddish expressions, so to speak German in Bukovina was to speak, obviously, the local variant of the language, which was very polluted um, as, or contaminated as, uh, by local other languages and not sort of the correct high German from Vienna. So these writers became uh, particularly proud of their correct German and followed fin de siècle Austrian and German literary movements, in particular the critique of language prevalent in the arts. And their, their models were Rilke or Franz Werfel or Stefan George or Karl Kraus, who provided Bukovinian poets with linguistic theories that justified and reinforced their attachment to tradition. For Hirsch and Spitzer, this adherence to German was a core ingredient of what they call the idea of Chernovitz. The idea was expressed in the identification of many middle class and working class Jews with a Habsburg world of yesterday. a Deutschtum from which they were geographically and politically removed. It's important to emphasize, however, that German Chernovitz for them quite naturally included also the multicultural and multilingual flavor that had always animated the city's public life. The mixture of languages that resulted in a characteristic local jargon, the intersection of West and East, urban and rural, modern and traditional. Indeed, an unusual interplay between nationalism and receptiveness to various cultures left its imprint upon Bukovinian literature of the 19th century, anticipating the political and literary developments that followed World War I. So translation was complicated in cities like Chernovitz by competing movements of national revival. German language literature competed with the promoters of the newly valorized vernacular language which in Chernovitz included Romanian, Ukrainian, but also Yiddish. And you might remember that Chernovitz was the site of the famous 1908 Congress on Yiddish, uh, whose aim was to consecrate Yiddish as the sole national language of the Jews. So this is the Chernovitz Conference is a, a sort of an important date in the history um, of, um, of that language. Okay, so. This one is an intensely translational city where German dominated a landscape of struggling national languages, each living with its own time frame and symbolic space. Now, I said the first road was the book uh, by Hirsch and Spitzer. A second road that led me to Chernovitz was the important work of Alexi Nuss on Paul Zalan as the emblematic Chernovitz writer and translator. Alexi Nuss has written what will perhaps become the definitive account of Tzelan's wrestlings with translations in its various permutations, as an avenue towards the work of other poets, but also as a means of opening up his own language, of making it strange to itself. In his Lieu d'un déplacement, which is the name of uh, Alexi Nuss's book, Sites of Displacement, it's, he wrote the book in French, the idea of movement is treated both literally, 
Tzilan is an inhabitant of Chernovitz, Tzilan as refugee in exile, and metaphorically, Tzilan's language itself in movement against its origins. Tzilan's re relationship to German emerged out of the distinctive patterns of the Chernovitz experience. The cel I'm, and here I'm quoting Hirsch, the celebration of German as transhistorical, pure, and re redemptive on the one hand, and the consciousness of German as the language of increasing prejudice, irremediably sullied on the other. So the post-war German poetry of Paul Celan and his generation emerged out of these contradictions. His trajectory moves from being a poet at home in the German language, a poet embedded in the Chernovitz milieu, to being a poet who detaches himself from tradition, distances him himself from what has become a damaged tongue. Celan produced a considerable number of German translations of Romanian, Hebrew, French, R Russian, English, Portuguese, and Italian poems. He translated Ungaretti, Shakespeare, Emily Dickinson, Robert Frost, Marian Moore, Mandelstam, Pessoa. He, he translated a great deal. So Celan, who's the emblematic um, Holocaust poet, um, the emblematic Chernovitz writer emerging out of this very multilingual um, in milieu, um, used translation in his writing, both to translate other poets, but to translate German out of itself, because Celan's German is very much an estranged German. The third road that led me to, Jer to Chernovitz was the monumental work of Neubauer and Cornus Pope, and I've referred to them, in their multi-volume history of the literatures of East Central Europe, and in particular, the new understanding that they promote of cities um, whose literatures were a product of contact and multiplicity. So I gave you a list uh, earlier, um, all these Central European cities, which were all multilingual in, in extremely uh, productive and interesting ways, but whose histories we don't study because these histories came to an end, because this multilingualism and, and, and uh, um, um, volatility uh, was, you know, immobilized uh, by the Second World War and the Soviet occupation. Czesław Milos, the great Polish writer who grew up in the city of Vilnius, remarks on the resemblance among certain Central European cities, and particularly the resemblance between Czernowitz and Trieste, a city that is very dear to me and which I've already studied. He confirmed my sense of the family resemblance between these two cities. I was delighted to find this quote. Both small local capitals teetering between a sense of marginality and a feeling of self-importance, diverse cities that promoted strong literary communities. And this is what he said. He said, I think it is difficult for young people to understand, and he's talking about Vilnius because he grew up in Vilnius. I think it is difficult for young people to understand the nature of the enclave that Vilnius was before the war. Neither Polish nor not Polish, neither Lithuanian nor not Lithuanian, neither metropolitan, neither provincial, though above all a provincial city. In hindsight, he says, I see that Vilnius was a bizarre place where all the spheres mixed and were superposed, a city like Trieste and Chernovitz. So Trieste and Chernovitz both lay on edges of empire. Trieste on the west and Chernovitz on the east. Uh, so here is Trieste, which is in the top, top corner of Italy. Um, it is Italy, but not Italy, uh, to continue. Uh, this is Trieste during, <clears throat> at the end of the Second World War, teetering between Italy and Yugoslavia and saved in extremis in 1953. Only in 1953 was Trieste uh, actually attached to Italy. For five years, there were these two zones, Zone A and Zone B, and it wasn't clear whether they would, um, it was only in 1953 that they became. And here you see, uh, this is a map of the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire in 
1914, and um, the Tyrol, uh, actually the Tyrol, um, takes away slightly from my claim that Trieste is the most western <laughs> part of the empire, because there is this little jacking out thing. Um, Trieste is over here. But it's pretty, it's pretty western most. <laughs> um, okay, so they are similar cities. An aura of nostalgia pervades memories of both cities, evoking periods of an idealized cosmopolitanism. So what, in fact, were the nature of their cultures uh, of cosmopolitanism and what kinds of links sustain these cultures? So using translation as a kind of empirical testing ground, and I say this, I, I would like to add that um, this, is a, this is tentative work. The work on Chernovitz is, is a beginning kind of work. So I won't say that I have done this empirical testing, but um, this is the beginning of a project to investigate the ways in which literary connections were made or not and how they endured. So what were the translational roles played by the German language and can these roles be compared to those of English today? So let me just very briefly introduce uh, Trieste to um, give some sort of context. So, for four centuries, Trieste was a historical anomaly, a city politically and economically Austrian, but culturally Italian and geographically Slovenian. Legendary for the rich literary culture it nurtured, including writers James Joyce, Italo Svevo, and Umberto Saba, for the exuberant mixtures of peoples who gathered there and later for its position as an outpost during the Cold War, Trieste has become something of a cult city. Despite its geographical distance from most Habsburg cities and despite the unique situation of the competing historical claims of Italian, German, and Slovenian, Trieste and its language dynamics are best understood when placed within the broad constellation of Habsburg cities. And it was the fourth largest of these cities in the 19th century. That is Italo Svevo. Also Italo Svevo. And that's his famous novel, La Crescenza di Seno. Um, and let me uh, briefly, this portrait of the city as a site of mediation must include the translations undertaken by many cultivated and erudite Triestine women, especially before the First World War. So Trieste as a site of mediation between German and Italian. John McCourt recalls the special reputation of Triestine women as highly educated and independent. He says they studied music, often attended university in Vienna, Graz, or Florence. They spoke, in addition to Triestino, at least three languages, Italian, German, English, or French, and were usually very widely read. Trieste had a very um, privileged position as the gateway into Italy of German ideas. And it had a, a very remarkable intelligentsia um, of, of uh, German educated Italian speaking citizens. One of these remarkable women was Amalia Popper, who was a private student and then longtime friend of Joyce's and perhaps his lover. Uh, in Giacomo Joyce, there's a, a, a mystery woman, and it's sometimes considered that the mystery woman is Amalia Popper. And she was the very first translator of Joyce, um, who lived in Trieste for some 15 years. She translated five stories from the Dubliners, and under the title Araby, published this uh, translation in 1935 and appended to this translation the first elements of Joyce's biography to appear in Italian. This would have been both an exceptional and a predictable activity for a, an exceptional activity because the first translation, but also predictable in a certain sense for a Triestine educated woman. Uh, Trieste enjoyed a true flowering of women's writing compared to Italy. It was not Italy. On the Austro-Hungarian model, women in Trieste enjoyed relative emancipation 
and sustained access to higher education. They were active as journalists and writers. Um, and I have a whole slew of names, which I'm not going to read to you, but there were many, many translators uh, from German to Ital Italian, or vice versa, mostly from German to Italian. And Slovenian women were also uh, prominent. So these women formed uh, a remarkable group of writers and translators who acted as mediators between German and Italian. So the literary culture of Chernovitz also included a culture of mediation. Um, one more, am I in the popper? So the literary culture of Chernovitz also included a culture of mediation. German writers and poets, both those who had remained in the Bukovina and those who returned from elsewhere, created their major works between 1919 and 1940. Though their works vary considerably in style, theme, and purpose, they share common attitudes. The receptiveness to various cultures that result from Bukovina's situation as a border zone. A strong interest in problems of language and translation inevitable in multilingual surrounds, a tendency to assimilate into German culture, a tendency often fed by ambivalence towards their own legacy, their own religious legacy, and a fascination with Germany, with German. So many authors undertook works of translation. Uh, the one who's most well known uh, is Alfred Margot Sperber, who was particularly active as a translator, giving German translations to poems by a wide variety of American and French poets, including Apollinaire, T.S. Eliot, Nerval. Many of the Ukrainian and Yiddish writers began writing in German before turning to their own language. So Rosa Auslander, who I'm going to be mentioning, translated not only the work of the Yiddish poet Itzik Manger, she also translated her own poems. Among other important Chernovitz writers, Aaron Appelfeld, as he moves to Hebrew, but remains obsessed by questions of language and accent in his novels, as well as with the exploration of language as home. Uh, the remarkable novelist Gregor von Rizzori, whose novel um, Memoirs of an Anti-Semite, his memoirs um, were um, became uh, extremely um, well known about, came out about 10 or 15 years ago. Carl Emil Franzos, Itzik Manger, I had mentioned, Clara Bloom, Edith Zilberman, and others. So in this very last portion of this Edge of Empire presentation, I'd like to mention two writers of particular interest. So Rosa Auslander and Olha Kubilianska. These are two women whose paths most probably did not cross. They were of different generations, but especially from two different milieus. Rosa Auslander was of Jewish descent. Kobylianska was Ukrainian. Both have left a significant heritage. Auslander as a poet of nostalgia, wandering, and loss. Kobylianska as a founder of Ukrainian modernism and feminism, a writer of prose negotiating the turn from a folk to a modern urban culture. So Auslander was born in Chernovitz in 1901, and she died in Germany in 1988. Kobylianska comes from a slightly older generation, she was born in 1863, so there are 40 years difference uh, between them. She was brought up in a village, but moved in 1891 to Chernovitz, where she lived until her death. The pictures of her are old. She, we, 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 might, we have to assume that she was not quite as stern and as that, although she did have a reputation for being a, a stern kind of woman. <laughs> and that's Rosa Auslander. Auslander's was a life of wandering. She left Chernovitz for New York early in 1921, 
returned to Chernovitz in 1931, spent the war years in Chernovitz, and in 1946 returned to New York, and then finally returned to Germany in 1965. She spent the war years in Chernovitz in the ghetto, in severe hardship, but she did survive in the ghetto in Chernovitz. She had close links to Paul Celan, and it's said that she was possibly responsible for the famous uh, line, Black Milk of Mourning, which is one of his most famous lines, apparently is an, an echo from a, a line from Rosa Auslander. But she also cites Marion Moore, Wallace Stevens, and E.E. E. Cummings as strong influences because she spent all that time in the States. In contrast to Celan, she is not obscure or difficult. What is especially interesting is the back and forth movement of her poetry between German and English provoking an unstable relationship and putting into question the very idea of an original. Kobylianska, by contrast, lived all her life in Chernovitz and surroundings, in relative poverty, but finally achieving recognition and indeed celebrity in her hometown. There's a museum dedicated to her in Chernovitz, and the main street, which was called the Herengasse by the Austrians, then was named for a Romanian writer today is called for Olha Kobylianska. As Chernovitz has become a Ukrainian city, I guess I forgot to mention that. <laughs> so uh, uh, Chernovitz goes from being a city in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, then Romanian, then there's a period of uh, Nazi occupation, and then uh, after the war, it's the Ukraine and it has uh, uh, different, so it's now Chernovitsi, um, whereas previously it was Chernauti, and before that, Chernovitz. So I'm calling it Chernovitz, I'm imposing, uh, I'm imposing one identity on it. I, could, I should be calling it Chernovitsi, which is what it is today. Um, in 1971, in response to the question, why do I write, Rosa Auslander wrote the following words. Perhaps because I came into the world in Chernovitz, and because the world in Chernovitz came into me. That particular landscape, the particular people, fairy tales and myths were in the air. One inhaled them. Chernovitz, with its four languages, was a city of muses that housed many artists, poets, and lovers of art, literature, and philosophy. In several of her poems, she mentions this image of the multilingual city. The myth of Chernovitz remains powerful, <coughs> despite the tragic events of World War II. For Auslander, as for Celan and a good number of other critics, there was something especially conducive to literature in Chernovitz, in a city where cultural mixture was a fact of everyday life. In the poem Chernovitz Before the Second World War, Chernovitz is evoked by Auslander as a peaceful hill city surrounded by beech forests, Four languages in accord with each other filled the air. Until the bombs fell, the city breathed happily. Another poem opens with the invocation, landscape that invented me, and goes on to describe the Bukovina as water-armed and forest-haired. This image of the convivial multicultural city persists despite the fearful events that followed. Um, and in one very well-known poem, she says, my fatherland is dead, they have buried it in fire. I live in my motherland, which is word. So what remains is language, the motherland of the word. And of course, much has been made of the fact that Rosa Auslander returned to Germany and returned to writing in German, which, uh, which was not a step that many of the Chernovitz poets uh, took. Um, Appelfeld went to Israel and became a Hebrew language poet. Time, of course, uh, Appelfeld was younger. These, these are obviously decisions influenced by age as well. So, um, Auslander translated a great deal, um, not only uh, other poets, but uh, herself. And she wrote uh, poems in English. So the fragmented nature of Auslander's various exiles and returns points to a complex diasporic state in which homeland and foreign land are not opposites, but instead 
points on a moving map. And so the translational world that Auslando represents is not only the interactions of the city where she grew up, but the ongoing engagement with English and America. The diaspora, we, we could say, is also part of Chernovitz literature, since so many of Chernovitz's authors were forced into exile. So, uh, Kobylianska was the founder of the Ukrainian women's movement and wrote novels and stories. Her education was in German, and she was influenced by the German classics throughout her life. Many of the mainly rural stories that she wrote are almost Gothic in their intensity. In one story, a wife kills her husband, and the children live in terror of being killed as well. Though in the end, the story shows sympathy for the woman browbeaten by the drunken husband. So this is the kind of Gothic, very, very intense uh, emotions in, in the uh, living in the, in, the, in the countryside. But Kobylianska also wrote very urban stories told in modernist form. There's one that's, um, one that's told in dialogue form, a, the story of a she and a he meeting in a park. He, the distinguished doctor, she, an opera singer, he, German, she, Ukrainian. There's a strong strain of nationalism, Ukrainian nationalism in her stories, and some small suspicions of anti-Semitism, yet there is also an openness to other cultures. In another story, Kobylianska tells a story of three women living together in one house in the city, sharing an apartment and artistic interests, making their lives as independent artists and scholars a radical idea for the time. So she began writing in German, but then translated herself into Ukrainian, translated her early work. And uh, in many cases, her first drafts are in German, and then she writes um, in Ukrainian. So there's a very clear shift from those two languages. She remained influenced by German literature, very influenced by Nietzsche. Um, there's no question that she used German models for her writing and remained influenced by these literary works. While she was criticized by some for this German influence, others wrote that it was important to recognize world literature, to transport you out of the, into the broader world of ideas. Hers was a conscious desire to embrace feminist ideas to organize a secular women's organization. She was the actual founder of the first feminist organization of, uh, in, in Ukraine, which was in competition with socialist organizations who were more attractive at the time. She introduced strong, self-sufficient heroines to Ukrainian literature and herself led a somewhat unconventional life, having a strong bond with another Ukrainian woman writer when writing about the country and the peasants, she showed that rural life was not harmonious and ideal. Um, she supported the Russians and then the Soviets as defenders of Ukrainian identity against the Austrians and the Romanians. And when the Romanians took the city in 1942, she was actually condemned to hang. But she died before the hanging was to take place. So she, this is to show to what extent she was um, she, singled out and very involved in, um, in politics, uh, both as a feminist and as, a, and as a communist. So what to make of the relation between these two women who would not have met on the streets of uh, Chernovitz or who might have met? What, can, what is one to make of this, these separate histories? Uh, both strong women writers, uh, both translational writing at the intersection of languages. Auslander, with her diasporic sensibility, her mediation between Yiddish and German, because she did translate from Yiddish into German. Kobylianska, in her mediation between German and Ukrainian, both taking from the city the premise of this fundamental plurality. I'm not trying to suggest that there was mutual influence between the two, their literary and social worlds were far too distant from one another, although one could fantasize about a possible meeting between the two, imagine what they might have thought of each other's work, and how they might have dialogued with each other. <laughs> 
but each used the multiplicity of Chernovitz as a stimulate, stimulant for their writing, the creative tensions of this city at the edge of empire, far from the certainties of the center. For Claudio Magris, it is the internal contradictions of border cities that make them seismographs, registering the upheavals that transformed consciousness at the turn of the 20th century, the crisis of the individual, the tragic irony of modernity, which is without foundational values and certainties. The coexistence of battling identities in the city shaped the consciousness of writers and created a unique atmosphere. Like Trieste, Chernovitz was a place where writers turned their backs on one another, facing their own imaginary homelands, but at the same time, united in their affiliation to the German language and German literary ideals. How do Auslander and Kobylianska illustrate the tensions of translating at the edge of empire? Their respective positions with regard to the German language are revealing of writerly choices during the decline and then the fall of the empire. Kobylianska moving from the shared vehicular language of German into the emergent national language, Ukrainian. Auslander rejecting the move towards Yiddish undertaken by some of the Jewish population of Chernovitz to remain loyal to the word of the mother tongue, German. Both acknowledging the multilingual city as crucible of their creative worlds. There are many other translating stories that could be told, stories that took place or began in Chernovitz, that take off from the city, moving around the world. Fascinating story of a poet called Clara Bloom who tra traveled to the Soviet Union and then China and translated from the Chinese. Appelfeld, who took his Chernovitz sensibility to Israel after his miraculous survival as an eight-year-old. Gregor von Rizzori, whose memoirs and novels of Chernovitz life are profounding, profoundly revealing of the fault lines that would split open to make way for the tragedies of war, enmity, and then inclusion within a new empire. So, in conclusion, the border experience of Central Europe since 1918 has had an intensity not experienced perhaps in Western Europe. It provides exceptionally fertile territory for the writer and for the translator. A maze-like density of history, shifting borders. For Milos to be privy to different narratives means to have a deeper insight into what constitutes Europe. To live on the edge of different realities is to have an intensified knowledge of the relativity of values. The border has often been interpreted as a place of nostalgia for the benign Central European microcosm, a vanished ideal of the cosmopolitan Middle Europa. But it is also a space of dispossession and deterioration, de of mourning and loss. Thank you.